of Yes We Cannibal. Welcome to this week's edition of Beat Beat. Hi, I'm Liz from Yes We Cannibal, and welcome to our Sunday Salon series, Meet Meets. Uh, this week we have Robert Mann being interviewed by our dear comrade John Lewis uh, and co-founder Matt Keel. But upcoming, we have some super exciting Meet Meets as well. We have next Sunday on the 20th, um, the Accursed Chair, who is a conceptual art NFT project. Uh, so we're looking forward to probing their feelings about blockchain and commerce in this new arena. And we have a closing for the current show, um, No Thing Nothing, with Matt Keel and myself, happening on February 25th. Um, from 7 to 9, as well as some um, weekly meditation offerings Wednesday from 6 to 7. As always, we are free and a home for experimental projects that might not have another place here in the city. You can support us with things like merch, posters, and through our Patreon. Please consider checking it out. And a giant thank you to our current Patreon supporters. We wouldn't be able to do this without you. Um, thanks again for joining us here. And without further ado, welcome Robert Mann and John Lewis. All right. Well, we were already chatting a little bit, but uh, we're here with uh, Bob Mann. And you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm just finishing up my uh, 16th year at, at, on the LSU faculty, um, teaching political communication in the Manship School, Mass Communication. Um, before I went to LSU to teach on the faculty, I, I taught as an adjunct for several years and really fell in love with teaching. And um, But I had been working in politics for about 20 years before that for a number of a couple of U.S. senators and governor and been involved in politics and campaigns around the, around the state. Before that, I was a journalist. Um, I you know, dabbled in journalism all, my, all, all the time that I've been in uh, even in politics writing on the side writing a column for the picayune for about five years working on you know book projects that whole time having a very indulgent boss and in john bro when i worked for him i spent 17 years on his staff and he encouraged me to write and to continue writing books and all that and so um i've been able to sort of ex ex uh, create the whole time i was working in politics which is really kind of unusual most politicians want 100% of their staff's time. They don't want you off doing other other projects. So uh, the, the the sort of the thread through my career has been writing journal and journalism, and um, and that's why one of the reasons why I wanted to come talk today when I was, you invited me because I the the threat at LSU to academic uh, freedom and the ability to keep you know do, doing what I do and other people to continue doing what they do, I think is real, and we need to start talking about it more. Uh, you know, as we have a kind of national and international sort of community of people that were enmeshed in and who will see this, um, many of them may not be entirely familiar with what happened, is mm -hmm. it two months ago now? Um, yeah, December, early December, yeah. So just uh, in your own telling, uh, obviously everyone in the room mm -hmm. knows what I'm talking about, but I'm curious if in your own telling, how the story unfolds of kind of what happened with Landry and yeah. his... My wife, I, I have this, my wife and I had this inside joke, is that it, most of these stories start with I was just minding my own business. And so, I'm just minding my own business uh, at the faculty. I'm on the faculty senate at LSU. I'm the, the faculty senator for the mainstream school. And... Um, so the day that there's this, this early December, there's a faculty senate meeting, and um, I was the spon one of the sponsors of a resolution that uh, was aimed at, be at tightening up the COVID protocols on campus, um, mainly around testing. The students didn't, didn't want to get vaccinated. Um, we would require more than monthly testing, which is which was and still is a joke to, to, to say. Okay, so you're, so you're, if you don't want to get vaccinated, you're going to have to get tested, and we're going to test you once a month um so we had this resolution and for several months there had been all these a lot of public comment before the meetings uh it takes it takes forever to get the resolutions through the senate so that day um landry decides uh, the, the, the attorney general landry decides to send over 
one of his assistant attorney generals to read a letter from him uh, that basically says that uh, what we are proposing is against is against the law, you know, and, and it's just his his sort of um, his anti-vax, pro, you know, personal freedom um, mantra, and so I'm sitting there and uh, listening to this, and I just you know I, 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 I'm kind of live tweeting the the meeting anyway, and I just I just observe, and I don't remember the exact words that I used, but I said it was kind of you know ironic that um, a guy who um, considers himself pro-life is taking a position that I you know, think is antithetical to, to you know, you know, the broader pro-life uh, position, encouraging people not to get vaccinated, encouraging people not to, you know, to care for each other's health. And I said you know, something about he, sends a, he sent a flunky over to, to read the letter. And that was what he took. I was, you know, so accusing him of not being pro-life apparently wasn't offense. Was it what he took offense at? So um, I don't know. It was three or four days later, I guess. And what I learned later is he called President Tate on the phone, and in a seven-minute phone call, told him that I needed to be that I needed to be um, reprimanded or punished for calling his uh, his aide his aide a flunky. Um, and then apparently he, he follows it up with a letter to Tate, as if it weren't bad enough to make the phone call. He call, he follows it up in a letter to Tate saying that um, that I should be reprimanded, punished, or whatever. I'm not sure the exact words he used. I, 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 um, all I know is that it took LSU. So so in so from the the time that Landry made it clear that he'd done this, he uh, it. There were two national academic freedom organization, FIRE, and the other one. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I can't remember the, the name. It's it's a it's a it's a run by uh, some faculty around this, the country. But one of the person who wrote the letter was a was a, a professor at Princeton, who they, they write they wrote they both wrote letters to to LSU, protesting what Landry tried to to, to do and, and trying to violate my my freedom of speech or to get LSU to violate my freedom of speech, however you want to look at it. In that time, it took LSU more than 24 hours to come up with something to say. Originally, they, they, they told several reporters that talked to me that they had no comment. Uh, and I think only after I shamed them and others shamed them did they issue this two or three sentence, very anodyne comment that was just very, um, it, was, it wasn't bad. But it wasn't specific. It didn't. It didn't defend me or any any faculty member by name. It didn't refer to the incident. It just said we support academic freedom in general. And um, and then simultaneously, we have and I know this because I have people who were in the room arguing, urging the faculty senate president and others on the faculty senate executive committee, whose part of their job is to defend academic freedom, free speech of faculty and others at LSU, said to this day have said nothing about, the faculty senate president had nothing to say about this. And, um, and, and so, you know, we're, LSU didn't, didn't pursue this in any way, I, I wasn't punished in any way, but officially LSU, no one at LSU said anything to defend, you know, my free speech rights. They, they say, we always support academic freedom for everybody. But what, what, what I came away with was that, that Every conversation that the president and others at LSU are having with Jeff Landry, I think, are being had in the in the context and with the understanding that this guy very well could be the governor in two years. This guy could very well be the person who sets our budget, who determines whether we um, get the revenue we want to for pay raises, and get the get the capital outlay money we want to build a new library and all that. So we are going to um, we're going to tiptoe around this guy. And um, and simultaneously, I think every faculty member who is who is not tenured, or even those who are tenured but want to be promoted to full professor or whatever, are looking at this, saying, "Whoa, wait a minute! You know, um, what does this mean for me? You know, it's probably it may be better for me to keep my head down and not say anything, not speak out, um, and then and I'm 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 going." I'm answering far more than what you asked, I know, but I'm trying to put, put it in this larger context that I think is swirling around LSU 
people at LSU, faculty members at LSU are, are really well aware of what's going on in, in Florida, in Georgia, in uh, South Carolina, and other places where there, are, where there are active aggressive threats at either destroying tenure or undermining tenure. They're aware that the architect of the undermining of tenure um, in, um, in Georgia, this guy Dinley, is now working as a senior official in, at the Board of Regents. Um, and um, and, and they, they see a faculty senate unwilling or unable to defend faculty free speech rights. They see a president of the university who, uh, whose first act uh, was to, or one of his first acts, I shouldn't say his first act, but one of his first acts was to preside over an attempt to abolish the faculty council, to abolish, at least abolish the, the, the governing um, deliberative functions of the faculty council, you know, sort of kneecap the, the faculty council after we had convened the faculty council earlier in the year to urge LSU to, to ha pass a, a vaccine mandate. And so, you know, if you're a, if you're a junior faculty member, if you're, if you're, even if you're somebody like me, a full professor you know, with tenure, you're thinking, whoa, wait a minute, you know, what, what, what is going to happen a couple of years down the road when, when Jeff, Land when, if Jeff Landers is governor, or, or if, if it's Billy Nungesser, or if it's any, you know, name your Republican, with the, le with the legislature we now have, what is gonna happen to you? So you've got a, a couple of choices at least. Just put your head down and stay quiet or leave, you know? Because the, the consequences of standing up, like I did, and speaking out, and I'm certainly not the only one speaking out, and I don't wanna portray myself as some you know, lone hero. There are a lot of people at LSU who are doing the same thing, but the, the consequences of it is that no one will really defend you. Um, and, um, you know, if you're, if you want to be promoted, um, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's better just to keep quiet. So there's a, there's a self-censorship in this, it's the, the, the subtext is, is, you know, I mean, the, the, the unspoken message is really loud. And I think, I think people, you know, everybody at LSU is smart enough to hear what's really being What's really being said here? Everybody was everybody was paying attention. Heard Bill Tate's 24 hours of silence, uh, and, and it, it, it was a deafening silence, you know. And so um, they really were. It really worries me where this is where this is going because we see, um, you know, the, 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 with the reapportionment happening right now, um, the, the, the legislature is not going to become any more democratic, even though it should. Even though it should become more racially diverse. It's not going to happen. There will be 29 black, there are 29 black districts now, majority minority districts. There will be 29 after this is over with. And um, the next governor, if, he's, if he or she's a Republican, will have a very compliant legislature and, you know, God help us all. I'm here, I'm here to be really optimistic. <laughs> That's my most optimistic scenario for all of this. No, the, honestly, that is my, my most optimistic scenario. It's, I, I, I can't be the only person out there who took a moment to go to the OED and look up flunky. And uh, as it turns out, flunky quite literally means a lackey who does the work of their superior. Um, uh, and the irony of a you know, educational institution um, operating kind of on the colloquial, potentially offensive meaning of this rather than the OED itself is right. uh, itself, I think, really telling. John? <laughs> Yes, yes. It's also very interesting, you know, being state employees that we have a person, as you mentioned, in the most optimistic scenario would inevitably be the boss who has the most power over our employee in your, or anything else of that nature. But the ability to actually politically organize around these things or to take any stances on this is seemingly shuttered. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, honestly, I got involved in the faculty senate because I thought that the, the I and others thought that the that the current faculty senate was, you know, the current leadership of the faculty senate and the and really the senate at, at, as a as a generally as a body was is is very ineffective and uninterested in defending faculty in general, faculty free speech rights or whatever. And you know what, and even I think even in the best case scenario, even if with the most um, aggressive um, activist faculty senate, it would not be enough. I think what, what, what campuses like LSU need is a union. We need, we need, you know, we need, a, we need a staff and faculty union. 
And we're not, we're not going to get it, not in this state, um, anytime soon, at least. Um, but what you know, so so um, even with a union, we we would be we could be sitting ducks in a way. But with a with a with a with a very dis un, un, disorganized, poorly led faculty, we're going to be you know we're, we're, they're going to pick us off like like it's going to be nothing you know. And they decide to come after us, and so you know. I and others on the faculty senate who who are, who are, who are trying to reinvigorate this this thing feel like you know we've got to start preparing for this. I mean they're coming for us. I mean they're everybody in the legislature who who I mean you know the the, the critical race theory um, controversy over the last few months or whatever has you know I mean it, it, if they are going to they're not just going to be picking on people like me who use the word flunky. I mean they're going to come after curriculum. I mean they're going to come out they're going to, they're going to be they're going to be banning the teaching, not of just critical race theory, but they're going to, you know, they're going to interpret that writ large to anyone who teaches anything about um, American history that somehow offends a white person is going to be, I mean, it's, it, it is, there's, it is just so clear to me that that's where we're going in this state. I mean, it's just, the, the script is being written in other, mostly Southern states, and it's, it's, it's coming to our shores. And I think the only thing that's really stopping it at this point in Louisiana is that the the boards of these institutions are have been appointed by a Democratic governor. I mean, the, the majority, you know, everybody who serves on the LSU board, everybody who serves on the on the on the uh, University of Louisiana board, on the board of regents, they've all been appointed by John Bell Edwards. Six six eight years from now, that will those people will be gone, and we'll, you know, we will not have anyone left who's, who I think is willing to defend the. Free speech rights and the, and the and the academic freedom of of faculty members, and that will you know if you want to want to destroy higher education, um, that's a good way to do it. So. Whew, that is a that is a bit there. And uh, something that uh, jumped out jumped out at me as you were saying this and talking about the CRT and how it's much more expansive than that one theory, right? Even if you can watch the publicly recorded viewings of uh, the legislative debate that we had here, right? Like, it would end up in a state in which, like, oh, we can't talk about the fact that, you know, the Mississippi River levees were maintained by slaves, the land at downtown Baton Rouge, the Exxon Mobil plant, our state capital, LSU, LSU. all sit on <laughs> were plantations that would be woefully just removed, pushed to the side. It's not something that is tangible when we talk about places like the place that we're doing this interview in right now, South Baton Rouge. So it's definitely something that is very concerning. And when you think about it, it's like, you know, well, what does this, where does this leave us at? What are the things that we can do or what are the things that we can try to do against this? Well, I, I, you know, well, I, one of the reasons I'm here talking about it today is that I think we've got to let people know that it's not just an LSU community thing. It's not just people who work at LSU or have children at LSU. I have two children at LSU, both, both two seniors at LSU. And, you know, there's this period of life that people sort of care about the what goes on on the academic side of the university and their children graduate and they don't, you know, they don't care as much anymore. Um, I think it's... I just finished writing a book um, that'll be out later this year about Huey Long and LSU, and I make I make the point in the book that you look at how whatever you think about Huey Long, he took a, a very um, sort of mediocre, small, mediocre university, and over the in, in about three or four years, he turned it into a a, a, a a nationally renowned university that you know wasn't on par with Ivy League universities, but he was attracting Ivy League talent here and reinvigorating or invigorating this place. He took it from from small, middling to, to very successful to on the cusp of really being a great university, you know, in, in over less than five years. And and then he and, and then he and his people almost destroyed it by, you know, trying to uh, steal everything you know the president goes the president of the university goes to prison in, in 1940 and the governor goes to prison all about you know, how he was stealing from LSU but my point is is that we can make this place great in a hurry but we can also destroy it in a we can also destroy it in a hurry and um, that it has enormous consequences for the state I mean we think that it's not just what you know LSU what, what, the way LSU effect of, of impacts Louisiana and the way that Southern impacts Louisiana the way that UL and ULM and Louisiana Tech 
affect this affect the state isn't just you know what goes on 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 campus i mean if we the, the this is a it's a huge economic driver in this in this in this in this region uh the research that we do out there has implications far beyond the state far beyond this this community and James, my friend james carville says this a lot he says there's no state university that is more important to the culture and the um the economic well-being and cultural life of a state than LSU is to Louisiana. I don't know if that's true or not. I think it may it may be, but I but I but I do know that it is really important to the state. And LSU has from the time I before I went to work there till today, LSU has done a the people who have run that university have done a terrible job of telling that story. One of the reasons why we can't get a library, a new library at LSU, is because LSU has never told the public, has never told the legislature in any kind of coherent, persuasive way why it's important to have a library. LSU has never really told the, the people of the state why it's important for LSU to be a great university. We don't tell our, we just don't tell our story. And uh, so it's, to me, it's not just about defending academic freedom and defending free speech and, you know, recruiting good people to come here and, and, and do research. It's also just telling the story, you know, telling why should we care? You know, like, because if you go up to the average person in the state and say, why should you care about LSU? The first thing you're going to think about is football. This, you know, and that was the, that was actually, that was the case in Yui Long's day. I mean, Yui Long built LSU on sort of the back of the football team, but there was other things going on. You know, he was using it to, you know, to build the rest of the university. And it, at least Yui Long had a story to tell. You know, he told the story of LSU, and it was a great story. It had a really compelling story about how it was taking young people, all of them white at that, in, at that time, sadly, but taking young people, you know, from all around the state and then this region and giving them an education that they wouldn't have had otherwise, you know, and really lifting the state up economically in a lot of ways. And he told that story really effectively throughout the country. And we don't tell our we just don't tell our story. And so I think that part of the, the job of, of those of us in higher education is to tell the story of the university and tell people why they should care about this this school, um, what it what it would mean to this community, what it would mean to the state if it went away or if it got if it got politicized to the point that it that it that it no longer mattered and that that um, you know like Bill Tate's when Bill Tate gets gets hired, he says the first you know, he wants to um, he wants to improve research. And you know that means bringing research dollars, and research dollars are usually attracted to universities by either people bringing them to, or you know, uh, uh, winning grants or bringing their bringing their grants to LSU when they when they when they move here. And my my argument against the abolishment of the of the faculty council, for example, was that you know if you say if you say research, you really mean it. You want to bring you want to really reinvigorate research on this campus. That means people, you know. That's not just dollars falling out of the sky. That's, that's faculty, researchers applying for those dollars and or and, or bringing them here. And if they're leaving or not coming, then those dollars are going elsewhere. And we've got to. So, to me, the the, the issues of of academic freedom have everything to do with research. Have everything to do with the research dollars that they want to talk about. Because if, if if people get this, if people get the feeling that this place is is not a place where you where you're free to uh, pursue the kind of research you want to pursue without political influence, they're not going to they're going to leave or they're not going to come here. And uh, those discoveries, those patents, all of that that would that, that could um, do for us, like the University of North Carolina did for North Carolina, will just you know will never happen. Here. So what's the most optimistic, if you've given us the pessimistic scenario, what's the most optimistic scenario? Well, I think the Asian most, time. yeah, well, I think the, to me, <laughs> the most optimistic scenario is that, the, is that, is that faculty members and others in this community wake up to the, um, the importance of um, defending, a, the importance of a, of a, of a strong, of a, of a, of a, of a strong faculty that, uh, that have rights, that this is a place where people want to come. I mean, you know, so I go back, I keep going back to 1930s because I spent so much of my time research, researching that. But people, but there were, Robert Penn Warren, 
you know, he came to LSU in 1934 because LSU was on the rise because he, this, this seemed like a place where, you know, where you could make a mark. And I would, I would really like to see LSU get back to that point where people wanted to come here, where, 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 where you were, where, where you, you, know, you had the, the, um, the ability to make your mark, to, to pursue your research, that your research is supported and celebrated, and um, and that you were that you're not punished for you know for for going in any the way your 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 inquiry leads you. Um, but that, but you know, people like Robert Penn Warren didn't, didn't wouldn't come here unless they thought this this place was on the rise. And so, if you so, I think we've got. I think there's a, we have a chance. You know, we have a chance. We've got a we've got you know we're the we're the first SEC school with an African American as president, which is a story to tell. Are we telling that story? I don't know how well we're telling that story. I don't know the implications. If it's just one person, you know, it may not be, mean that much. But we've got the beginnings of a story to tell of, of potentially maybe a more diverse student body, a more diverse faculty. Uh, I would like, I hope that that's the direction we're going. I mean, this school is, um, has never had more than 14% African American student body, and it's, and it's as high as it's ever been, and it's at 14% right now. Um, there are, I think, only and I'm here. You asked me to be positive. I'm being negative again. But I, but but I, but but I, but I think you know we've got a chance to move in that direction with with Bill Tate here. You know I think he's he could he could start building something around this. We've got at, at, in the whole faculty. If I'm not mistaken, I think there are 12 um, tenured black female professors in the whole out of 1,700 faculty. We've got I think a dozen tenured black female professors, and I think. Three of them are on my faculty, on down the hall from me. So that, and I'm one of the smallest. I'm in one of the smallest units on campus. So we've got the so a very undiverse faculty. But I'm actually a grad student, finishing a PhD in mm -hmm. geography and anthropology. Mm -hmm. And Joyce Jackson, who's fantastic, Dr. Jackson is. Uh, she's tenured, and she's mm -hmm. our first ever. I believe she's our first ever non-white male chair in you know 100 years. Um, and again, I mean, our department was very inspiring. I think Carl Sauer, you know, he's very sort of famous mm -hmm. for bridging anthropology and geography. And he came, he sort of helped found the program here, you know, with a great sense of optimism, I think, in the same, uh, same time period. But our legacy, you know, of basically sort of oil money and kind of like white male chairs yeah. is obscene. You walk down the hallway and you look at a photo of every single chair and it's, you know, I, I don't want to say it could be a KKK meeting, but it's yeah. not too far. Well, I mean, it, we, yeah, we've just got such a, this yeah, I spent a lot of time looking at every every um, gumbo, you know, the yearbook from the, like nineteen ten through the sixties. Just I mean, it was like at some point you realize, holy smokes, it's just white people. You know, you know, you know, in your intellectually, you know, it's white, it's all white people. But when you just you know, page after page, a sea of white faces, you realize how many how many young black people in the state never got the opportunity. That you know, John, that you got, you know, who, to come to this, to come to this place and get an education and get get the advantages that being an LSU graduate gives you in this in this state. All the lives, that all the the economic wealth, all the you know, all the resources that never were passed on from from this university to that person because they never got a chance to come here. And here we we've got a chance to do something about that, you know. And I want and I, so I, I I want I want President Tate. To, you know, I want President Tate to be the sort of the, the person that really helps change that. I mean, you know, he ought to be he ought, as a as a black man, as a human being, we all ought to be offended. But as a black man, he ought to be really offended that, that this university does such a poor job in, at that. It continues to do such a poor job at that, and and challenge us to do better because I think that that's I think we have a, we have the opportunity to to really transform this university and make it make the faculty and the student body more diverse, and I hope we take that opportunity to do that. I mean, it's interesting because uh, some of the audience members uh, and Liz and I had dinner last night and got to a long conversation about kind of critical race theory um, uh, and sort of how critical race theory is being used, but also that there is a kind of zeitgeist in consciousness right now on some level. There's some kind of broad passion among young people for racial justice, you know, and there definitely is a cohort of them who are like reparations, you know, this is the thing you know, we should be fighting for. So I'm optimistic about that, and it feels like LSU is situated in a, in a place, in a history where 
that could be the organizing principle, you know, it's like really demanding on some level to kind of take on the plantation history that underlies university. And I think, I think we could be formally stop the prison labor with COVID. I know that. As I understand it, yeah, I had some students who've been working on this who told me just the other day that they were told that yes, it has stopped. Okay, but it, I know it stopped because of COVID, but then there was a question as to whether or not Yeah, and, and w I may be wrong, but or they, they may have gotten bad information or inaccurate information or whatever, but they were told that, that the school is no longer employing um, prison labor. So I think they're going to, they're still trying to figure out if that's true or not. But they, as they were pointing out to me, there's still a lot of prison labor around this, around this you know, still a lot of prison labor around this town and then throughout the state. It's not just because LSU stopped doing it doesn't mean it's not happening. Yeah, being well, I mean, just being being a northerner by birth, uh, that was one of the more shocking discoveries for me. Mm -hmm. in, in moving here, was finding out there was prison labor. Yeah. Um, so how much? I mean, in, in terms of kind of the trend, if, if this is the kind of crystallization of a trend that's been going on for a long period, what's? Can you talk about Jindal? I mean, can you talk about sort of Jindal's influence on where we stand now? Uh, how much should we hold him culpable? I mean, see, yeah. is he the villain in the story? You know. Well, yeah, I think he was in a, in a, in a big way because, uh, you know, it's interesting, Jindal didn't, um, you know, Jindal didn't really come after, he spent, he, he made a few targeted efforts at coming after faculty. I remember uh, he, he attacked um, the idea of sabbaticals, you know, and that he got slapped back and he went away. You know, he just, I think, I think part of it was, you know, Jindal backed his way into uh, hurting L hurting LSU and hurting higher education, not because he wanted to go after higher education, but because he wanted to, to he wanted to cut taxes, and the consequence of cutting all these taxes was you know to undermine the state's revenue base, and that that filtered down to higher education. I don't think it was a conscious decision to go after higher education. I don't think he lost any sleep over over it, but I don't I, don't, I never got the sense that Jindal was fundamentally hostile to higher education. I just think he didn't care too much, and he was so focused on running for president and telling that story, you know. And he wanted he, all he wanted was to talk about how I cut taxes, you know, I cut taxes, I cut taxes, I resisted tax increases. I don't. I'm not aware that, that Bobby ever went anywhere talking about I'm really cracking down on those liberal professors, which I think is what somebody like Jeff Landry. That's the story he wants to tell, you know, because I think the the, the politics around that have, have changed in this country and in this state. So I blame Bobby mostly for just undermining, I mean, when I, when I came to LSU, the, the, the budget was, 75% of the LSU's budget was state appropriations, 25% uh, self-generated, you know, tuition fees. And now it's completely flipped, it's the other way around. And that's Bobby, that's largely Bobby Jindal's fault. But, um, but I, I, you know, Jim, I, the whole time I was, I was, you know, going after Jindal in my column every week, and they never came out. They never. I never knew if anybody tried to come after me or try to, you know, crack down on me because of that. They just, I think they, they just either ignored me or fired back at me. But they didn't try to undermine my, you know, try to get me fired. The difference is now, I think, with 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 Landry, is that it's the the the, the landscape is the landscape has changed, and um, there are just a lot more Republicans in the legislature to, you know, to back that up. I, you know, part of it maybe Jindal knew that he had, a, he, had, he, had, he would have more opposition in the legislature uh, to, if he went after us. Today, he, he knows that, that today the next governor knows that he won't, you know, he'll be able to have his way. And, and I, I, I thoroughly anticipate somebody like Landry making, making it his, you know, his, one of his platform, part of his platform to crack down on, on these woolly headed liberal professors, you know, who are, who are poisoning the minds of our young people, persuading them to hate, to, to be ashamed of their white. You know, I mean, that is just, you just, you just know that's coming. And it's, that it's, and, and that it's going to resonate. And the other thing that sadly I know is that I think LSU is, LSU and higher education in general in the state are totally unprepared to deal with it. They are totally unprepared to deal with it. They, they're not going to know what to say. Do you think the union would play, I mean, do you think we could have, let's say, United Campus workers really become a force? I mean, do you think that would be a critical linchpin yeah, kind of offset? I, I think it could. And I think, okay. you know, the, the, the combined voices of United Campus workers, uh, the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, a stronger faculty senate, a stronger, um, there's, so there's this, I can't remember the name of it now, it's the Council of Faculty Advisors, I think, which is basically the, the heads of the faculty senates from around the state, you know. 
that's a very weak organization. It happens to be led by the president of LSU's faculty senate, who you know, I don't think should be reelected, and I hope is not. So maybe maybe with new with new leadership that could be reinvigorated. But I you know, I just think faculty members need to organize, and they need to be they need to start defending themselves in a way that they have not. Uh, because it, pretty soon it's going to be too late to do it. It's just going to be too late. You know? What is that? What, what's that? How can they get organized? How can they get organized? Well, I mean, the first, the first way to organize is you know, form a union. You know, and, and that's been attempted in the past, but LSU has thwarted it and probably would continue to thwart it by refusing to collect the union dues. That's, that's how they killed it last time, was refusing to collect the union dues out of you know, deductions from pay, payroll deductions, which is, you know, if you can't, can't collect union dues, you're not gonna have a very effective union, you're not gonna be able to pay for for um, your activities and your organizing. So, um, you know, and I, and I you know, I, I, th I think that's what's gotta happen. I mean, I just see that a faculty, even a strong activist faculty senate is just basically kind of, you know, shouting at the faculty and defending. I mean, we still have some, we still have some, um, some rights as far as controlling curriculum and controlling the um, most in, in most cases the academic part of the university, but when it comes to the other stuff, we're just um, you know we're just sitting ducks there without a, without a union. If we if we can't collectively bargain, we're not going to have much. There's no reason. There's no one to really talk to on the faculty. There's no one. There's no one person or one organization that defends the faculty, um, and I think that. Um, we're, it's, it, it may be too late to do to do all that in, 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 at, at this point. I don't know. I, I, if there was if, if if there was more faculty sentiment around reinvigorating the, uh, the the faculty senate, I would be more encouraged about the possibility for uh, a union. But if we can't even get the faculty to get involved in the senate, what is the you know what are the chances that the faculty would be for a union? I think pretty soon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, in the what, 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 what union organizing or what faculty organizing would protect is this idea of faculty agency on campus that would, and one of the things that I would like to hear and I think people would like to hear as well is, because uh, we, we've gone, we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but what are some ways that a health, that basically faculty having more agency on campus to, you know, say what they need to say, do the research that needs to be done and do those things help create a healthier campus community in a sense? First, you know, I just think for, for anyone watching who, I mean, I wanted, I do think it's important to distinguish between academic freedom and free speech because they are two different, they're related, but they're two different things, right? So everybody, if you, if you read the, the university's policies, every faculty member, that means adjunct, non-tenured to full professor to void professor has academic freedom. It's not, you, you don't get academic freedom because you have tenure. You get academic freedom because you're an academic and the university believes and says it believes in academic freedom. It believes in inquiry. You know, it believes in, in unencumbered inquiry, free inquiry. Um, so everybody technically has those has those rights uh, protected by policy memo 15. Realistically, if you got tenure, you got more rights. You know, because it just make, just makes them harder. All it, all, it does, all tenure does just makes it harder for them to fire you when they decide that they don't like what you're teaching, um, or they don't like your behavior or what you're saying. But when it comes to free speech, you know, everybody at LSU has free speech. I mean, every, every American has free speech, but and every American has the right not to be punished for their speech by a government official. I mean, the First Amendment is what protects, it's not policy memo 15 that protects, that protected me against Jeff Landry. It wasn't my, it wasn't academic freedom that he was violating. He was violating my free speech. He was trying to get the government to punish my free speech. And, um, and in some ways, that was the more egregious violation, I think, you know, because it was, he was violating the, the U.S., I think he was violating the U.S. Constitution. And, uh, I mean, he, he, you could argue he was committing an impeachable offense, uh, which, of course, no one, you know, no one's going to pursue that. But, um, so, we, you know, we, we got it, we need public officials who respect not just academic freedom, but free speech, the, 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 the right of a faculty member to make a political statement on a non, um, it was my personal, my personal Twitter account using my personal phone. Uh, I wasn't speaking for LSU in any way. I wasn't, you know, and and yet he he, want, he wanted LSU to punish me for that. And so um, 
I, I think it's important to distinguish that, you know, I think point out that he wasn't violating my academic freedom, he wasn't violating my free speech rights. So, um, but LSU was not prepared to protect either. And so I think what LSU, if LSU, if, if, you know, so I, I told, I've told, I've, I've told my, I've said that I'm not gonna, I'm, I cannot in good conscience serve on another search committee until I, until I feel like LSU um, is, is more aggressive officially and unofficially in protecting the, the free speech rights and, and, the, and the academic freedom of its people because I'm not going to sit on a, on a search committee and tell some, some young woman who just graduated, just got her PhD from Wisconsin and wants to come down here to say, hey, you're, you'll, be, you'll be fine. You know, LSU's gonna, you know, you're gonna have, you're gonna have full freedom to, do, to pursue the research you wanna pursue, to, to, to speak up and say what you wanna say and no one's going to try to punish you. I would be lying if I said that and so I'm not going to. I'm not going. To, I'm, I'm not interested in serving on search committees and lying to, to, to prospective faculty. And I think other people are starting to feel that way. And this is a long roundabout way of asking your question. I'm sorry, but but I think it's going to. I think it's going to start impacting the kind of people that we're able to retain and attract to this university. And that's going to really hurt the reputation of this university if it hadn't already, if it hadn't already happened. I mean, you know, around the country institutions and particularly higher education institutions have violated the trust that they had with their workforce, their faculty, their staff. And LSU is, is no exception and may be worse at LSU than other places. People are gonna, people are gonna leave. People are gonna start leaving. And, and who are they gonna be replaced by? They're gonna be taking their dollars and what, and their research dollars and what are those, how those research dollars gonna be replaced? They're not, in many cases, they're not going to be. And this place is gonna be diminished and it's gonna make it harder. I mean, what, we, we could be going into a death spiral, you know, eventually. Um, not just because of lack of resources, but because our, in, our inability to attract people because we can't guarantee them that they'll be able to pursue their research free of the attorney general or the eventual governor coming down on them when, he, when, when, when it runs afoul of what he thinks they ought to be researching or teaching. So, uh, in the history and Louisiana as a whole, and I'm curious, has there, have there been any other points in LSU's story where they have continually failed to protect faculty or staff in, from these outward attacks? Yeah, well, I, and this is, uh, this, thank you for, for, uh, for teeing this up for me. This, this, is, a, this is a book, um, it's called Cane Juice. It was, it was written in 1930, published in 1931 by an LSU English professor, John Earl Euler. And um, he lost his job because of this book. LSU fired him, it was a novel. It was, it was a novel about this 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 um, this, uh, this Cajun kid from Lafouche, Bernard Cuvignon, who comes to LSU and wants to study sugar cane science. He ends up he ends up making a, a revolutionary discovery that, that that saves the sugar cane crop. But um, in the the book describes some you know today no one would even bat an eye. But in, in, in 1931 there was some behavior from, from some, by some LSU co-eds that scandalized a, a local priest here in Baton Rouge and he took out after Professor Euler and Professor Euler had the misfortune of having testified in a in a criminal libel case the year before against an LSU student who was very close to Yui Long and so um, Yui Long when LSU went to fire this guy, Yui Long kind of encouraged it and, 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 and very much supported it. They fired, they fired the guy for writing a novel that, that, that pissed off one priest. And, um, and he, took the, he took the case uh, nationally. It, got, it became a cause of a cause celeb around the country. The ACLU in New, York, in New York took on his case and he threatened to sue LSU. And, LSU, and it cost LSU so much in, 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 re, in its reputation that LSU finally gave the guy his, his job back late the, the spring in the spring of 1932 but it was LSU was so thoroughly politicized in, in, in that you know the governor was clearly running the universe Yui Long was running the university um, the, the students like this like his name was Kennedy Kimball uh, Kimball Kennedy um, he was so close to the governor that he was telling the governor which law he was a law he was a law student at the time he was telling the governor to the, they needed to get rid of the dean, so the governor tried to fire the dean. It was just so thoroughly politicized that um, that nobody on campus had any confidence that that they could do their research, they could they could pursue, they could freely inquire into whatever you know they were hired to, to, to research or wanted to research without 
angering the governor and getting fired because this guy wrote a novel. It was, I mean, I, 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 challenge, I challenge you all to get this thing and read it. It's the most, it's the tamest book you've ever read in your life. And he got fired, he got fired for that. And so you can just imagine what that said to everybody around this place about, okay, you know, you can't step, don't step out of line because what could happen, they, they put John, Ed, John Earl Euler's head on a pike, you're next. And, um, and so long learned his lesson. The, 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 the moral of the story, or the end, through the ending, sort of long kind of learned his lesson and backed off and left the faculty alone for, for the most part for the next few years. He, he focused mainly on firing football coaches and band directors and left the faculty alone, which was great. It took, you know, I, I think he got his hand burned on this. But it, but it was, but the university was so thoroughly politicized um, that I, I do think it had a, it had a serious chilling effect on, um, on, on the faculty. And you know, honestly, I, I look at you know sort of the long from nineteen from nineteen thirty thirty one through, uh, you know, currently, LSU has just always been a very political institution. You know, it's just always been overly politicized. It's been. Um, the governors have taken an inordinate amount of interest in LSU and have, um, in many cases, directed affairs at LSU in, in ways that are, you know, sometimes helpful, many times unhelpful. But it's just been, you know, I haven't lived, and I haven't, haven't worked on any other faculty, and I know there are other places where the where the where the universities are politicized. But it just strikes me that LSU is the most politicized university that has no political stroke of any place I can imagine. I mean, this, this place is just thoroughly shot through with politics, and yet it has no stroke down at the state capital. How is that possible? I mean, how can, how can this place be so politicized, and yet it has no political capital? You know, it just, they, it's, just been, it's just been totally wasted. It's just been totally squandered. I mean, it, it seems like the, the, the benefit of being politicized is the, the politicians ought to be supporting us, and they're not. You know, so it's just, it's, we got the worst of both worlds in that, I, you know, from my, from, from my perspective. And you know, nothing's, nothing much has really has really changed. A whole, you know, it's just sort of it's just been kind of this little bit of an ebb and flow of the political influence of this university. When you know, when a governor really wants to, when a governor like Mike Foster really wants to put money into it, it rises, and then and then it, then it recedes, and it rises, and it recedes. But it's always dependent on the whims of the governor of the legislature. It doesn't have a standing of its own. It doesn't have its own reputation. It doesn't command. Um, it doesn't, and I'm not saying it should dictate to the legislature how it should be supported, but it, it, but you would hope that the, that the that the university itself would have the political capital to resist political interference and also demand that the that the that the, the leaders of the state support it like it ought to be supported. It, it, well, one thing that comes to mind that, that's interesting is. Um, she comes from a friend of ours, Evan Leonard, who's an outstanding undergraduate in English and philosophy. Um, he that I think it was last semester, a student reporter was locked out of a faculty senate meeting, and so yeah. even the ability of students to actually become kind of political operatives, political agents on campus seems kind of uniquely diminished at LSU. And yeah. certainly, my grad students, that's true. And I just sort of wonder. I mean, there's such a lack of. You know, one of the reasons we started Yes Be Cannibal, I think, in part was because it felt like there wasn't a cohesive kind of intellectual and art scene community, mm -hmm. you know, and it's remarkable in that way. And so it, it, there's a sense that kind of, uh, you know, students at LSU um, have very few successful avenues to actually have. I wonder if you think that's unique here or what role you think it plays? I mean, is, yeah. there, is there a way in which, you know, the, the LSU student newspaper could have more agency, more power to actually change some of what we're talking about? I, you know, I think I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Reveille. I think they've done a really good job. They've got some, you know, strong uh, uh, a reporting staff as they've had in a long time. So, you know, not, they've had some really good people over the years, but they've got a really strong group of activist uh, journalists there who are doing good work. And, and actually, the um, Piper Hutchison was who was the reporter got thrown out of the meeting. I walked out in solidarity with her um, because I, you know, I, I they, they, it was an illegal, it was an illegal executive session. In fact, I think part of the reason why Jeff Landry wouldn't defend me is because the faculty senate realized, the faculty senate president realized that he was he was investigating the faculty senate for what it did. They're, they're putting the faculty senate through some sort of mandatory um, training on, in compliance with the open meetings law in, in March because of this meeting, because it wow. was an illegal, an illegal meeting. But um, 
but she has been covering the faculty senate in a way that I don't, I, I, can't, I can't remember anyone covering it in the, in the time I've been here. And so um, I think they've realized this is, this is this, what's going on here is kind of important. What's the, the larger issues that I was talking about are, are, are playing out, you know, in that faculty senate and, it's for, and we, need to, we need to shine more light on it. The faculty senate executive committee has been meeting, you know, without anybody showing up, doing it. She started going to those meetings and reporting them, shining some light on them. Um, actually, if you talk about optimism, I'm, I'm optimistic that, that the Reveille may be the, the media organization that puts, that shines light on what's going on with the faculty and faculty governance in a way that, that really does help reinvigorate people. Wow. Because, because, you know, I think most faculty just have never known what goes on in the faculty senate. I mean, I started, when I got on the senate, I started reporting to my faculty, here's what's going on. And I think a lot of faculty mem members who are on the Senate don't tell their faculty, don't always tell their faculty, here's what happened at this meeting last week, you know? And so um, the more they find out, I think the more, maybe the more engaged they will be. And I think the, the, the Reveille could play a really big part of that. Interesting. Do you, oh, sorry, Jeremy, I think yeah. of the question in the audience. Uh, well, I'm just going to broaden the question there with the Yeah, I think there. I mean, I, you see, you see sort of um, glimpses of it. I don't know if you you remember uh, how those uh, a group of students shut down the athletic department last was it last summer? They had to sit in all day, you know. And I was I was so proud of them for doing that. You know, they refused to move, and um, so and they made an impact, and they got on it. They made news, and you know, I think they helped change some things. And so um, I, I, you know, I really encourage my students to do that kind of stuff. I, I, the course I teach is really about activism. So most of my students are, you know, hoping they're, I'm hoping they're trying to make some good trouble around campus. And I always tell them, look, you know, you've got to be, you've got to be willing to take it to the next level. You can't just ask for the meeting and they say no, because they know that the semester, they know when the semester's over, they know when they can just run out the clock on you. Go sit in, go have a sit in, you know, go just sit in their office. And do that kind of stuff. You got to escalate sometimes. You know, do it legally, and or if you do break the rules, be prepared to be punished. But but um, yeah, I mean, it's it, I, but, but it frustrates me. It always has frustrated me. But it's it's you know the, the faculty is a is as you pointed out, the faculty is no less asleep in some ways. You know, just either demoralized or asleep. And um, I, I do think it goes to leadership the same way that I think the, if the faculty had stronger leadership at the Senate level, the faculty president was a stronger, more activist person. I think the faculty could get more involved, would be more, um, would be more inspired. I mean, I think it's just about leadership. And I think this, you know, the, that's why these, these, um, these student government elections are so important, but only, but you know, it's like out of 30,000 students every year, about 2,000 students participate. I mean, you know, uh, it's about, I think it is about leadership. I think it, you know, and so um, I don't want to. I don't want to be. I don't want to be slant. I don't. I don't even know who the current fact, the current student body president is, and I don't want to slander anybody's. Been, but, but I do know that it is. You know, from the days of when Russell Long was student body president, it's always seen as a stepping stone to political life in the state. So, you know, the the incentive is to sort of get along. You know, you're. You know, and so I think there needs to be maybe a different. Um, a different sensibility about what student government does as there needs to be a different sensibility about what the faculty senate does. You know, it's not seen as being, you know, they get they, the faculty senate, they see themselves as sort of, just sort of, you know, managing the curriculum and that kind of thing, you know, and the faculty, the student body 
the student government people kind of see themselves as managing yeah. this and that, and then they're a little staying in their lane. We need to, maybe we need to start getting out of our lanes, but again, I think it goes, I just think it goes to leadership. <laughs> out of the cafeteria, <laughs> and it made the Washington Post, it made a number of other you know, publications, and it's like, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm ready for yeah, the yeah. walkouts. I'm ready for the mass walkouts that happen, particularly here in the South, to, to at these institutions where these kind of, uh, 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 these kind of laws are just being passed mm -hmm. and debated. I don't, you know, I don't know the extent to which faculty are talking about this to their students even, you know? I mean, the faculty, I mean, I, you know, it's, I don't, in some in some ways, I'm not sure the faculty, the students are gonna be any more braver than they see the faculty and staff around them, you know? So maybe maybe it is up to us to be more, you know, to, to, to uh, model that kind of behavior, I don't know. Um, No, I'm not running for faculty senate president. I, but I, but I am supporting. I am very strongly supporting a colleague who I work who I work closely with, who uh, who I hope who I'm pretty sure will be running, and I'll be strongly supporting that person um, and others who I think are going to who are going to run for the faculty senate executive committee. So, um, I you know I I I, I know that I'm not that you know I I'm old enough that I've sort of figured out what my talents are, and and it's. I, you know, I don't. I, I think I'm better. I'm a, I'm a. I'm a better advocate for faculty, sort of on the edge of the of the edge of the inside than in the in the very inside. So that's the decision I've made. But I'm. I'm but, but I think we've got someone who's going to be a very strong candidate. Who's going to. Who's going to. Who if if elected would. Who who if elected would be, a, a, a really activist, the kind of activist that we need. Another question. Um, you are, I think, somewhat unique or at least sort of visionary in your use of social media. You are extremely active and, I think, a masterful Twitter user. Um, and I'm just curious. About I should tell my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you write that down there, <laughs> um, And uh, so I, I, I'm just curious where you see, I mean, it's interesting, obviously, because, you know, Twitter itself and all these platforms also have their, you know, their, their corporate and they have their various forms of suppression of free speech and et cetera. But at the same time, it does seem like you've struck a balance of using this kind of social media platform for kind of counter or meta institutional purposes. And I was sort of curious to hear you kind of reflect on that and sort of where the line is between using that platform for kind of appropriate um, accountability, mm -hmm. you know, versus slander. It's yeah. kind of the thing that came up, uh, I think, inappropriately with a uh, Landry episode, mm -hmm. and yet I think you walked that line really well. And I'm just kind of curious your feelings on, you know, Twitter and social media and these kind of other forms that we now have for kind of like you know dialogue outside of the university that are still tethered to it. Yeah. I, well, I so there's uh, there's a lot I'd like to say about that, but I'll try to keep it concise. I mean, I th I, I I try to, um, I, you know, I, I'm conscious that a lot of, that a lot of my students and both of my children are following me on Twitter. So I try to behave myself in way. I try to. I want. I want them to be proud of dad. You know, I don't want them to think dad's an ass, an asshole. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't want them to think that, that dad's a, a jerk. You know, I'm. I'm sorry, young man. Uh, but you know, I also don't want them to think that, uh, you know, I, I'm also also want to be proud of me that I'm that I'm the kind of person that, you know, that speaks out and you know and says I want them to you know I, w I want to model good behavior in in all kinds of ways for for, the, for, for my students and my and my children, um, and it just it, it it I've been I'm I'm fortunate enough to have built a following that's large enough that I that you know that I'm that that I do have some influence and I just feel like it's kind of to me like tenure that you, it's you, if you have it for a reason you bet you ought to use it you know I've, I've been accused of abusing my tenure by by colleagues who I who I've said you know I think it would be derelict of me I mean I'm I'm saying stuff that untenured faculty can't say I'm I'm and I'm doing the same thing on I think on Twitter and other places on social media where I'm able I, I'm I'm saying what other people want to say, but don't feel like they're able 
to say, you know, and I'm and I, and, and I think it's important to to be to use your platform in a responsible way, but in a socially conscious way, you know. And so I wanna, I want to, you know, I, I just it, it, either use it or get rid of it. I mean, you know, I'm 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 not I'm not interested in just sharing cat videos, you know, even though I do, do I do that sometimes. But um but but I but I but I do I do struggle with it because I, I tweeted something yesterday that I deleted. I, I didn't apologize for it, but I deleted it because I thought it was um that I'd crossed maybe crossed a little bit of a line and um I want to be. I want to. I want to be. I want to be tough. I want to be honest, but I also want to be respectful, and I don't want to be disrespectful. And but I. But I also. I. But I also tell my students. I tell them every the beginning of every semester that civility in politics is a tactic, not a virtue. That there are moments when incivility is is a, is appropriate. You just need to be ready for the consequences of it. You need to be. You need to know what you're doing. It's like you know. If you're. It's like using a power tool you need to if you're going to use it you need to know how to use it so you don't you know saw your thumb off you know so I, I try to I try to be careful with it and I try to model for them if you know when I'm being uncivil in some way that I'm doing it purposely and I'm conscious of the consequences that it might uh, result you know, that might result how would you so it, when you say uncivil my first thought is civil society versus uncivil society um, and I was thinking how the way in which you use Twitter you know, and Twitter has or social media in general, it kind of has its own rules and its own, mm -hmm. its own protocol and etiquette. Yeah. Um, I would certainly hold it accountable in many ways for this sort of bizarre behemoth that quote unquote critical race theory has mm -hmm. become, which is really so big and so much broader than what critical race theory actually means. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder, you know, what, what with uncivil, what, is there is there some connection between kind of uncivil society that we can, you know, yeah. activate through these social media platforms? Well, so the, the way I put it to my students is that if that that in politics, and I'm talking in a, you know in a political context here, um, that you should do what works. You know, do your your job is to persuade people. You know, your job is to persuade people or, or influence people. And if you're if you're in, if you're um, if you're that the influence is negative, if you're turning them off, if you're if you're making them you're sending them away, even if what you're saying is true, it's not effective. So your first, in politics, your first job is to be effective, is to, you know, advocate in an effective way. So I, what I say is, if you're going to be uncivil, if you're going to, you know, and I, and I mean uncivil by either, you know, protest or, a, you know, a, even, you know, something that somebody might claim is insulting or name calling or whatever, do it, be, uh, in a, know what you're doing, do it purposely, Think about the consequences of it, or am I like the flunky thing? You know, um, I didn't start out thinking that I was going to bait Jeff Landry into doing what he did, right? But in a, in a way, he, it was sort of a bit of um, creative non, inadvertent creative nonviolence, right? I, I was uncivil. I mean, you could—I I don't think calling someone a flunky was particularly insulting, but you, if you, even if even if you assume that calling someone a flunky was an insult, it it was an insult that. That got Landry to do something that I think ultimately hurt him, and maybe helped awaken a few people around LSU about the you know the dangers of the dangers to 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 academic freedom and free speech on the LSU campus. So in that sense, it was effective because it was I think it was a you know an inadvertent, an accidental bit of creative nonviolence. And so that's what I'm talking about: is just be conscious of what you're. I, I want to be conscious of what I'm doing, and I want my students and others to know that you know that if um, that your first job is to do uh, is to do effective advocacy is to do is to do stuff say stuff that works um, that 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 being in, insulting someone just because it makes you feel better is not good enough if you're if you're if you want to advance your cause you got to think about the consequences of what you're saying so you know I, I like to be the kind of person that when I mess up I apologize just because that's what a decent person would do but I also think. It's also a, an effective political strategy to be, you know, to be apologizing when you mess up and to say I messed up. I'm like I'm going to be a better person. It's a just, you know, it's a, it's effective in a lot of. It's effective. It's good for your soul, but it's also just good for your politics. So, I think it's just, you know, being a good, just trying to be a good citizen. You know, and I had this, 
from the very beginning of, of being on social media, I have I have in my mind there's this there's this there's this really wonderful eighty ish year old woman at my church who follows me on social media. And I've always from the beginning thought, would I want Elva to see what I said? Here? You know, would would she be would she, would would she what would she think if she saw this? And I've all and I and I have violated that a hundred times, but I've always Taking it down because oh my god I don't want Elba to see what I just said you know I want her to I, you know so I think it's good in your I think it's good in life to have those little you know those little angels on your shoulder saying hey that's you know you know think about think about that before you think about what what Elba would think about that you know I mean that doesn't mean that I that I would always say well sometimes I'm going to say well Elba's just going to have to toughen up you know but I'm always think but I always try to think about it you know so I think it's just. Um, being also and also being conscious that um, you know your followers are, are can also completely can very quickly leave you. I mean, there's nothing they're not contractually obligated to keep following you, and you can lose you know you can lose your following and um, and you know and then maybe I'd have time to write more books. So it wouldn't be a bad thing, you know. Um, in, uh, in, the, in talking about civility, uh, being using it as a tactic. Uh, what are some ways that you think LSU could be a little uncivil in support of its faculty and staff? Well, I've always thought that, that the, you know, the, the president and the leadership of the university ought to be, that they ought to be more, um, that, they, that they ought to be more willing to, to speak truth to the powers that be down at the, the Capitol, that the board ought to be, um, willing to do that too. You know, the Board of Supervisors, they're all appointed by the governor. I mean, they're all close to the governor. What are they, you know, what are they doing? Um, are they really advocating, do, 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 legis do any legislators really know who they are? Do they, are they ever da down there advocating for the, for the university? I don't know. I've never heard of them being down there to advocate for the university. Maybe some of them are. But what, what I see is that um, very quickly, LSU presidents, and provosts and uh, government affairs people for LSU go down to the Capitol and they very quickly are told by legislators that, look, if you want to get stuff done for this university, just let us take care of you. Let's, don't, make, don't make noise. That's going to hurt you in the long run. We'll take care of you. We'll, you're, you're, you're hurting your cause by holding a press conference. So just, just tone it down. And let's go in this. Let's go into the side room. We'll have this little meeting. We'll talk about what we can do and what we can't do, and and we'll cut our little deals. And you agree to to trim your sales, and we'll give you. We'll we'll throw these crumbs at you. And every president, almost every president, and the only president who violated that got fired. John Lombardi, who went down to the Capitol and you know told them some truth, and they didn't like it, and they fired him. So you know maybe there's a lesson in there too. But but. I think that we need we need stronger leadership down. We need stronger public leadership by the people who run this university, and they need to be they need to be willing to be fired. They need to be willing to stand up to the legislature. They need to be willing to tell the story in ways that may not make everybody happy, um, but they need to be willing to defend this university. Instead, what they usually do is they go down to the Capitol and they get told. Hmm, don't say that. Don't say we're going to take care of you. Let's just have this little meeting and let's do our little deal on the side. And they get co-opted from almost the very first day. And and how has that worked for us? You know, how is that how how has that worked for LSU over over the generations? I don't think very well. So, if you, I think about uh, how you mentioned before that like at LSU has the first uh, African American president, in the and uh, we are also in the uh, second blackest state in the entire country. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially when it comes to people under the age of 18, 19, 16, it goes progressively. And the thing is, when it comes to LSU's retention rate of these people, it is under 50%. Uh, this is in, this stopped being published by the university, I think, about six, seven years ago. So when I think about these lineups between this, is the truth for the students and the blackening and browning population and youth of Louisiana more important? More important the university because people will be at students, they will be a growing population of these students. Will they just be left to the side to have their money taken as more, less than half of them matriculate in six years? Yeah, yeah, we, and we, yeah, we do, we don't, we're doing a better job. Under, I will give, you know, I, I need to say this because I think it's, to, 
very much to his credit, you know, we had, had this Go Grant program, which is designed to help um, underprivileged college students with, you know, smaller, with small grants up to three thousand dollars. But sometimes, as you may know, that it, you know, there are pe people who drop out of school for lack of a hundred dollars. You know, they just and the Go Grants, the Go Grant program, which was created under Kathleen Blanco, who I worked for, that was chronically underfunded for for twenty years. You know, or almost twenty years, and. Um, only under John Bell Edwards is it being fully has it been fully funded. Only un, only under John Bell Edwards is the money there uh, to fully fund the, the 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 perceived need for those for those dollars to keep those young people in college to keep them from from dropping out. We need more. You know, I think it needs we we need to come up with a lot more ways to do that. But we're we're moving in the right direction there, and I worry that that program will be, you know, kneecapped. In a few years, when when Edwards is gone, because I think it's only been fully funded because Edwards made it a priority. Um, but you know, so that's just one little that's just one little program that didn't cost a lot of money. You know, I think it was you know, fifty million dollars total out of a twenty billion dollar budget, and yet it was almost impossible to get the full funding for it until just the last couple of years. So it shows you the kind of you know not only the, the need is there, but just how hard it is to get just the minimum kind of help that, 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 that students need to go to college. And, and not only do we have the lowest, um, the highest minority, the second highest minority population um, in an LSU with the pitifully low minority population, but we also are the state with, I think, the, the third or fourth lowest population with, with any higher education at all. I mean, we have just, there's just so many young people out there who should be, you know, Giving given an opportunity, who should be inspired to to try to go to college or given some means of either community college or whatever to get to places like LSU, and it's just not it's just still not happening. We keep talking about it, you know. They have meetings about it every day at the Board of Regents, but the but the the state has never really made it a priority, you know, a real overriding priority to to find these young people and and get them into that into that pipeline, you know. Something uh, just becomes more pressing because going to school underneath uh, the general administration mm -hmm. and to the Bedwards admin El John Bell Edwards administration, there was a noticeable, you know, there's a noticeable difference in tactics and policy. And I just think that, just as you mentioned, that it will roll right on back. And what do, what does this mean then? Do we does you know like is will it just be like oh well you know these students are just going to wash out and we'll just you know, stay quiet about that? Or are we actually going to do something about the fact that, yes, we are 50 out of 50 in poverty. So this does mean we have a very high number of Pell Grant students, which means that mm -hmm. they need resources to actually stay right. in school. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, the, the, we haven't even talked about the, the, I think there's there's a lot of what's going on with, with hiring the guy Denley, who was the architect of the undermining of tenure in Georgia, he was also the architect of, I think, turning Georgia schools into more vocational, more more vocational learning, and um, and you know, you know, not completely, but maybe largely taking um, the uh, higher education system in Georgia and making it you know, turning the students into consumers, mm. and I think that that's. You're going to see more of that too. That that you, that, that's, that, you, that universities, or we're already being. You know, I, I, I had I had a faculty member in a big blast email to the faculty senate the other other day, calling all his students customers, and that's that's a particular way of looking at the people that you're teaching and mentoring, thinking of those customers. And I think a lot of people down at the Capitol want students to be seen as customers who are buying something. And who need something in return for the money they're given, and that's a whole way of that's a complete paradigm shift in the way we look at education. And I think that's coming; that's definitely coming. It's already happening here in other places. You know, the, the overemphasis on STEM, to the de-emphasizing the, the humanities, and the you know, and, and that's only going to happen more as people, more as legislators, more and more see places like LSU as, as more more vocational education, the liberal liberal education. And I think we can see some of that happening in arts, humanities, and social sciences as well, mm -hmm. you know, for sure. Mm -hmm. But where, where do you think it begins? Where do you think that sort of shift towards 
the student as consumer starts? So we can certainly see it now. Where do you see that? Where, how it started? Yeah, what's the ideology of it? I, you know, I don't know. I haven't, st I, 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 one of my, one of my New Year's resolutions is not to talk about stuff I don't know anything about. And, <laughs> and I don't know anything about that. I don't know where that started. I don't know how that's, I, I don't know how it started. That would be somebody else to answer that question. But I just know that I see more and more of it. And it's, and I think you're right. It is, it's going down to, you know, we're all going to be, you know, so the, so one of the, in, in, one of the innovate, in, quote unquote, innovations that Denley brought to, to Georgia was that, um, that you were, that, that your post tenure review, a lot of it was, was based on your grades, the grades you gave. And if you gave, if you, you know, you gave more C's than, than B's and A's, you were, you were a failure, you know? Um, and, and also that there's a metric now that they're working on, if they haven't already instituted it, where that your, your success as a professor is also uh, correlated with the economic, with the earnings of your former students. That's the first I've ever heard. Of yeah. That's yeah. So go, go and look at go look at what George has done. It's it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty disturbing. And that he was hired, he was hired by the Board of Regents, I think, more to bring that kind of an, quote unquote innovation than anything he did on on tenure. But go look at what go, I would urge anybody who wants to see what's what I think is coming to, to higher education in Louisiana. Look at what George has done because the Board of Regents of Louisiana hired the architect of that and brought him here. And he's not he's not here to to you know to do other that's, stuff. That's I guarantee. Bad. Like that's absolutely chilling, and I'm shocked right now because you know the tenure story has been so big and so ugly. Mm -hmm. That's what I focused on in reading about yep. it. Um, I don't even understand how that would quite work in terms of actually tracking and mapping earning potential. But that is a terrifying paradigm shift. Yes, John. <laughs> I see you equally aghast. <laughs> you know, as a some, you know, as a they, you know, they send us out. They send us the surveys each year. You know, the mm -hmm. first year after immediately as soon as you graduate, the first year five years, they have those check-in points and. That is something that I noticed was on there is how much money do you make? What is your salary range? What are the things there? And and, the, and, and, and that's to say that that it's not worth spending the money for someone like, you know, me or someone else because the, the state is investing this much money into educating these people and they're not they're not earning their earnings are subpar and so those those disciplines are not worth it. Or, you know, we need to consolidate those disciplines instead of having you know, 17 English departments around the state. We need, maybe we need to have four of them, you know, and, and, and we start, you know, so there's all kinds of mischief that could come out of that. And, um, and I think it starts with looking at what, what Denley did in Georgia. Hmm. It's almost, uh, almost seems as if they assume that there's 360 million STEM jobs for, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, so, right. And oh, the, part, the other thing that Denley did was Denley and his, it wasn't just Denley, but um, they started looking at they, 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 they so at, you know as you know at LSU, um, your first you, you, you're, we don't encourage you to to declare a major in your first year. You know it's, it's your year of exploration. A lot of a lot of people find their mate. You know they come thinking they're going to be in engineering, and they ended up in English because they took an English class that that inspired them, and they said, oh my God, this is what I really meant to do. At Georgia, they decided to really start doing away with that and, and encouraging you to take more and more of your major courses in your first year to lock you into that major, so that the so that the the cost of changing majors they raise the they raise the cost of it a lot because if you you know you it's it's harder to change your major if you've already taken you've already got twelve hours in your major that you know the first two sem it's, three semesters it's interesting because the British model you know might see sort of British kind of uh, primary and upper education is better. Um, but you do enter, you know, you kind of enter mm -hmm. the university with a major and often complete yep. three years. Um, but that's that's really disturbing, particularly for the arts. I mean, you know, if my God, if you attract art students and what they make in the first uh, several years after graduation, yeah. I mean, you would just abolish art departments. Right. You know, is that on the horizon? Oh yeah, I think that's that's, that's <laughs> definitely the kind of stuff that. I mean, look, it is not going to be difficult to kneecap some of these departments. You know, I just you just. That's why. That's why I just it just it just frustrates me that I think so many faculty around the state are just living in denial that somehow that this is not going to happen. I mean, it's going to ha it's going to happen. I mean, we're the only thing. The only reason it hasn't happened so far is because John Bell Edwards has been governor and he's been able to stave it off. And and he is not even. 
I don't think he's even thinking about it, but he's just, you know, he's appointed people who are, who are not amenable to that kind of thing. And even his, even his board, John Bell Edwards' board of supervisors for LSU is a terrible board. It's a bunch of, ter it's, a, it's a group of terrible people who are not, who do not have the best interest of that university at heart. But, but even the worst is better than what we're gonna get in, in, in six years from now. Uh, something that, uh, tying this back into uh, something that you mentioned earlier about how teach your students about about activism, about you know, about different things, about the tactics of civility and uncivility and other things of that nature, you know, and as somebody who is pushed right along that line, this is something that never, ever, ever would have come up in our classes. It was largely just reproduction of civility, of not engaging with this, of not engaging with this is a form of complexity. So when you mention this, if you mention the removal of these other programs, it's like it's kind of like almost like the dulling or the smoothing or let you go sit in a corner and do your engineering type of <laughs> thing. Yeah, I mean because I think the when when LSU goes to the to the state for money, the, the legislators, the legislators, and and some of the people, I think, and it's going to be more and more who are running the board of regents are going to say we need metrics. And, and Jindal introduced some of that too. I we didn't I didn't note how you know Jindal, and and I'm not I'm not against metrics. I'm not against measuring what we do. Clearly, we need you know that's not that's not inherently a bad thing. But when it's when it's done to to say that the the, the humanities are less valuable than um, the STEM uh, fields, then that, you know that's where it's a problem because um, that, you know that that just that just makes a whole lot of I think uh, inaccurate and and just um, horrible assumptions about where people are going to where people are going to end up. Just just you know just looking at you in the first two or three years after you leave LSU and making these large assumptions about where your career is going to be five, ten, twenty years from now is. You know, I, like I had students, I had students who, who majored in political communication, who graduated in political communication, who made the, who got, went to law school, dropped out of law school because she just, she figured, she realized she hated it so much. She's now a nurse. She went back to nursing school, you know? And so, um, maybe, maybe, maybe the legislature would have said, well, we should have put her, we should have put her in nursing from the very beginning. Look at all those dollars we wasted on, Educating her in this field, and she went when eventually became a nurse. And I would say she's probably a whole lot better nurse because of what she learned in our field and what she did, what little bit she learned in law school. She worked on Capitol Hill for a few years. I mean, I bet, I bet she's a pretty damn good nurse because of all the other experience she has. But she's but but no one's going to give her any credit for that. You know, they're just going to say those were wasted years. And I think we need to you know we need to. That's, and that's how legislators, or I think legislators, are, are, especially those without much experience in higher education, are very susceptible to those arguments. Because yeah, uh, I believe there is a, uh, there's still a push to uh, cap nurse pay in the midst of you know this pandemic and other things. And I think about it from the sense of, you know, like she's gotten a political communication education. She has learned about these things. So just as you mentioned, right? The, depending on what her track goes, you know, mm -hmm. I would assume that she'd probably be more inclined to be someone who would be do activism against this as a nurse yeah. as this would yeah. impact her and her colleagues. Yeah, so. she's probably just a, in many ways, just a, a well, better rounded citizen. You know, she understands the, the issues in ways that maybe someone who just has a very narrow understanding of, of healthcare would, you know. So, I mean, I think that, I think she got a great education, and I'm glad she found her real passion. But I'm, but I don't think that those years were wasted. But I think it would be really easy to argue that they were wasted. That's an argument that I think is easy to make, even though I don't think it's valid. It's easy to make, and and that's and that, that argument is being made. Is a um, you may have a uh, it is a complex, complex situation, but you may you may be familiar with the uh, engineering professor who was a uh, who taught engineering ethics who was fired before the pandemic due to a. Uh, Creating some alarmism, as they noted it at the time, about poten his potential COVID exposure. Okay, no, I, I, I'm not. If I was aware of it, I'm not. I don't. I forgot about it, so I don't know what. what I don't know what happened there. Oh well, uh, John Scal well, John Scalzo, who was uh, he was over student support services for the College mm -hmm. of Engineering, and he mm -hmm. taught engineering ethics. And you know, like guess as I mentioned, right? Like I, he was. I was his, one of his students for many, many years. But one of the key things is is that that program would not make you a more well-rounded citizen. 
and he teaches engineering ethics. So it's the closest that we may get to some type of, okay, it's not just these numbers and math and other boring stuff like that. But he took his opportunity to say, well, hey, like I may have been exposed to COVID and nothing is being done about this. And I have informed people about this and I am here in this room with you right now. Wow. So. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I know that one of Tate's passions is ethics. You know, certainly around, I know AI, he's very interested in AI mm -hmm. ethics. And it seems like, you know, a lot of this does come down to kind of these ethical questions, you know, about what is fundamentally right and what's fundamentally wrong. And I guess I wonder in sort of thinking towards the conclusion, you know, in, in speaking with you, if you had to identify, I mean, I hear you talking about the power of student media, um, the need for a union. Um, the need for just faculty bravery on some very basic level, um, you know, more student activism. But I mean, if you really had to identify kind of the, you know, the key points, the three, five key points to save LSU, to reinvent LSU, to make it flourish, what are they? Well, I think I, I, I go back, I mean, I've already said this, but I, you know, I, in a different way of putting it, I think L, the faculty, LSU is the faculty, you know, that the, the, the faculty runs the really is, is, is the, the, the group, the faculty council really should be running that university in so many ways. You know, I'm not talking about deciding how the facility services and deciding which buildings and all that, but I'm talking about you know, the other curriculum is the, is the heart and soul of the, of the university and we need to guard that. We need to protect that. We need to make sure that we don't let that slip away and it's, and it's being taken away from us in, in a lot of small ways, you know, and, um, in a strong, and the, and the faculty senate is the vehicle by which the, the the faculty expresses its its will on matters of curriculum and you know academics. And so I think we need to the the the, the school's going to rise or fall on on I think on this on the strength of that. And we need to guard that. We need to protect it. We need we need people who are, who who are on the who are on that senate who are who are active, not just to, to defend. The faculty, you know, not just defend our faculty rights, which I think are important, but to defend the curriculum, you know, to defend what we're here to do and to guard that and not let that be hijacked by um, administrators either who've never, you know, one of the one of the frustrations that a lot of us had, I think a lot of faculty had, is the decisions about us being pushed back in the classroom during the pandemic were being made by people who 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 have spent very who who are spending no time in a classroom. And maybe in their whole career, spent no, very little time in a classroom. They don't even know what we're, what, what, you know, what we were dealing, what we were thinking, what we were facing, because they weren't asking us. They weren't consulting faculty on these decisions for the most part. Um, and it's just, you know, that, you know, in a thousand other ways, where I think faculty are being um, marginalized. And it's only going to happen to the extent that we allow it, though. I mean, I think we're, we're, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these things are happening because we're not asserting our. Um, our rights to make these decisions. We're, let, it's, we're letting other people make these decisions. I mean, do you think, uh, and it may be too strong to say so, but it does strike me that kind of the CRT phenomena, you know, feels to me like a salvo, kind of an opening salvo mm -hmm. for the potential to really seize power over a lot of this and really kind of push forward a national agenda um, to really kind of steal a lot of faculty agency. I mean, to, you know, if we're Critical race theory may as well be at this point critical thought. I mean, essentially, right. you know, you can't talk about anything. Um, if certain things were to go through, and so I wonder. I mean, uh, do you see it as a phenomenon of that level of importance. I mean, do you see yeah. it as okay? Well, I mean, it's because it's it's. You know, I'm trying to remember what state is is trying to push through. Is it Alabama now that's talking about? It? It's not even. It's not just banning critical race theory. It's banning any any teaching that offends someone. I mean, it's you know, it's like it's like what. I mean that is just that is that is taking it to a, a, a wholly different you know level that that that, it, it, that if it makes a student uncomfortable, I can't talk about it. And you know, and, they, and they we're not even talking about the numbers. The, the, the more this happens, what's going to what's what's going to happen? It's happened in other states, and it's, I think it's already happened some on the LSU campus. Is that the students are going to be sent to you know students are going to be sent to to classrooms to record what we're saying. And use that against us, not only to generate bad press, which is mostly what it's been done, which how it's been used so far, but to get us fired for violating the law. And so, you know, I if it's one thing to say you can't teach critical race theory because that would only apply to one 
course at, LSU, at the LSU Law School probably, right? right? Mm -hmm. But it's another thing to say, you know, what I've just said, that, that, that potentially applies to every course. Maybe there's, there's this kind of leading out uh, with the news last night of, you know, critical race theory now encompasses Marxism in general and the Frankfurt School. And I mean, there's nothing to do with what critical race theory really is, which is very small. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see it kind of grow so it can be used for so many other political applications. Yep. It seems like uh, people may also be kind of missing that, you know, like this isn't just a campaign that is going on and it's going to be done in 2022, right? Like we're going to have our presidential candidates campaign starting to be launched in the next 12 to 16 months, if not the end of this year for 2024. So this is likely something that is going to be a major topic that is going to continue to grow and revolve into over the next three to four years and then maybe even beyond that. And what you're bringing up there is one of those things that, you know, when people look at this and they're just like, oh, they're just talking about things with identity politics or race or something else like that, that there is a bit more to this, something a bit larger to this. Yeah, no, that's right. And it's, it's going to start in 2023 with, um, and it may, you know, I mean, John Kennedy will probably be talking about it before too long in his reelection campaign for Senate, but it'll start in 20, for the, in the governor's race, which is already starting, but you know, more and more this year, you'll hear it, and it'll be legislative races as well. I mean, people saw how it worked in, in places like Virginia, how effective it was, how easy it was. They will do, they will do that here, no question about it. Well, well, that was uh, about an hour and a half, I just realized. So I, we can't thank you enough. I mean, it's just you have so much experience, you've barely even gotten to your biography, and you know, how much you've done and how inspiring you are, just because your voice is so, we're just absolutely thrilled, and this is really. Keep up the good fight, and we hope to see you again, so, it's okay.